Hi, my name is Aaron, and today I'm here with the second time of the Library of Public Health Forum. So, today we'll have two presentations. First, I'll be talking about influenza, and then we'll have Ashka Trevenu following up with feminist medicine. So, a little bit about myself. My name is Aaron, and I'm a current high school senior at James Logan. I am the founder of this Library of Public Health Forum, and I wanted to spread awareness about current public health issues. So, I hope all of you learned something today. Sorry about the board. There's some technical issues. So first off, I'd like to start my first presentation off with the top two current US-based outbreaks, and this time I've added on like a worldwide outbreak. So the top two outbreaks were the same as last time, although the numbers have gone up slightly. Um, the first, uh, the, most, the biggest one is the Salmonella outbreak. It's, the mechanism, mechanism is that it passed through the stomach and colonized the intestines and you'll experience diarrhea, vomiting, dehydration, and high fever. In this case, the, the source is pet turtles, but generally salmonella comes from uh, undercooked meat or eggs, so make sure to clean your hands and properly. And please food. celebrate called Hispanic Heritage Month. We're having our red okay. tomato art And class. generally, uh, symptoms are mild, so no treatment is needed, but uh, if symptoms are severe enough, you may take antibiotics. for all ages. The second uh, largest outbreak is a hysteria infection from ice cream. The mechanism is that it infects cells in the intestines and spreads basolaterally. You'll experience fever, muscle aches, and tiredness. So in this case, just uh, refrain from eating the recalled ice cream. And just, just like the salmonella infections, uh, no tre treatment is generally needed for mild symptoms and antibiotics are needed. So one notable outbreak around the world that I've uh, heard about recently was the Nipah virus outbreak in India. The mechanism is that the, the virus has two glycoproteins on its surface. The G glycoprotein, which sort of mediates the, the, with binding to the receptor on, a cell, on the cell membrane. And when it does that, it causes a shape change in the G glycoprotein, which activates the F glycoprotein which causes the fusion between the virus and cell membranes, which allows the virus to enter the cell. Now, when you contract Nipah virus, you may experience acute respiratory infection and, in some cases, fatal encephalitis, which is swelling of the brain. And this disease is a zoonotic one, and it comes from bats and pigs. So if you are in the region, avoid contact with these animals. And also uh, try to avoid contact with um, infected people and take necessary precautions if you think you are at risk of transmission. And um, generally, the patients are given supportive care uh, measures, but if uh, there are severe respiratory and neurological complications, they may need intensive support. So let's start, start our uh, talk about influenza today. So. Influenza started around, like, let's say, the problem started around 100 years ago, 1918, with the Spanish flu. It was quite deadly, but the, the virus, although we managed to, to like, defeat the pandemic, it has survived up to now. And each, each uh, October and up to like around February, we have a flu season. And influenza is a virus that causes an acute respiratory infection. There are two main types. Influenza A and Influenza B. Now, we, this problem has lasted over 100 years because the virus mutates very quickly, so there are many strains of it. Therefore, we are not able to eradicate it. Now, people who uh, contract flu, the flu generally recover on their own like, in around a week, and there's no medical attention needed. But certain populations are vulnerable to complications, and they may have an like, extreme inflammatory response and can have sepsis, which is incredibly dangerous. Influenza spreads the drop of transmission, so when an infected person coughs, talks, or sneezes, there may be a drop of spray, and that could contaminate surfaces. So when you think you are at risk of, uh, of uh, contracting it, you should you can wear a uh, wearing a mask is recommended, and try to not touch contaminated surfaces. The mechanism of the virus is that it has a viral protein on the surface called hemagglutinin. It binds to sialic acid to trigger receptor-mediated endocytosis to enter the cell. And once it enters the cells, it releases uh, VNRPs, or uh, rib uh, ribonucleic proteins, and they enter the nucleus through nuclear localization signals. And they, they're essentially genetic information, right? 
And the, the goal is that they want to hijack the cells and machinery so they can produce viral proteins. And then they can sort of leave the cell and infect more cells. However, um, it's sort of in the form of mRNA. And mRNA goes to translation in a ribosome to produce the protein. However, a mature mRNA has a 5 cap and a poly A tail. But these uh, VNRPs do not have a 5 cap, so it steals a 5 cap from nearby mRNA through cap snatching, and then it goes and hijacks the cell's machinery. And the viral particles are produced, and they leave the cell to infect the nearby cells. So, because um, influenza mutates so quickly, we have to fight different strains of influenza each year. So, there will be seasonal influenza outbreaks. We haven't been able to get rid of it completely because of this. According to the CDC, between 291,000 and 646,000 people worldwide die from seasonal influenza related uh, uh, respiratory illnesses each year. And so, how we fight against the influenza is that the CDC predicts what strains are going to be uh, most likely showing up during the flu season. And based on this, we, uh, ha we updated the vaccine to, to basically prevent or to fight against these specific strains that we predicted will show up. Now, how we do during the flu season depends on how accurate the prediction was. The flu season begins in October and peaks from December to February. And this is because in the colder months, because uh, notice this is around fall to winter, right? In the colder months, people tend to stay indoors more, and that increases chance of transmission, as well as the cold, dry air sort of drawing out the mucous membrane, which weak or lower, lowers our defense, our first line of defense against it, so it's much easier to get sick. So, it is important to administer the flu vaccine each year because, um, the, because the strain changes, and doing so not only protects yourself, but creates uh, herd immunity, which is important for protecting people uh, who are vulnerable to complications, which you'll get to on the next slide. So the people who are vulnerable to complications in influenza are children under 5 years of age, people with chronic health conditions, immunocompromised people, people of ages 65 and above, and pregnant women. So we have three main types of influenza vaccines right now with inactivated vaccines, which are made by taking a protein or a piece of a dead virus, and they're administered intramuscularly or by intradermal injection. There are live attenuated vaccines made from a weakened form of the virus, so it's still a live virus, but it's, it's administered by nasal spray. Because it's more similar to the real virus, it produces a more powerful like, immune response and therefore basically protects the person better. And now regional vaccines are made by taking a small piece of the virus DNA and administering it intramuscularly. So now you may ask why we don't just use live attenuated vaccines for everyone since they produce a more uh, they produce a better response. Now that's because well um, live attenuated vaccines uh, require somebody to have a, to be able to handle it. So they're recommended for children from two to five years of age so then they can have a better protection. But inactivated vaccines are recommended for people with chronic health conditions, ages 65 or above, or have a weakened immune system because they may not be able to handle a lot of viruses. Now, older people also should receive a higher dose of inactivated vaccine so they can have a stronger immune response. And finally, pregnant women are at high risk for severe complications and should be vaccinated with the inactivated vaccines. Now, pregnant women, uh, they can take the vaccine during any term because this vaccine is safe. Now, I want to talk about how vaccines work, first of all. Vaccines work on the principle of um, giving the person a primary response. When you first contract a virus, you don't really, your body doesn't really know how to fight it. So, it sort of just tries all kinds of antibodies to fight. Now, antibodies are produced by the immune system, and they are proteins which bind to antigens on the, vi on the virus to neutralize the threat. However, antigens are proteins, which means they, bind, they have protein specificity. Uh, specificity. Uh, they only bind to a specific shape, and uh, as a result, there has to be a unique anti uh, antibody for each antigen. So now your body has to uh, try all kinds of combinations to find the right antibody. And to do that, our, our B cells actually have 
um, the, the, the code in our DNA has all kinds of different um, exons which code for different uh, variable regions on the antibody. And what happens is that the DNA is differentiated and to produce a certain combination. And this differentiated part will contain the axons, uh, the, the exons, I mean, which are the parts that code for protein, and introns which do not. They have other purposes. So when we want to turn them into RNA, we will have to cut out the introns and we add a cap and a poly A tail. And then we can put these mRNA through the, the uh, through a translation to produce antibodies. Now, this process is called an alternative mRNA splicing. So from the primary response, our body will figure out which antibody will neutralize the, the virus. So once we know that, um, it goes, this goes into our long-term memory in our immune system. So when we encounter the virus in a secondary, we'll have a secondary response, which is much faster and much more effective because we already know what to do, our bodies already know what to do, and they mass produce this one antibody to fight against the virus. So that's how vaccines work in general. And uh, recently we've been uh, working on mRNA vaccines. It's been actually been used for uh, COVID-19 vaccination, and we've been trying to use it for influenza as well. So instead of, uh, let's say, for example, uh, putting in uh, pieces or pieces of a virus or like a specific viral protein, we can instead just put, put in the mRNA and code it by something so the body can destroy it when it's injected. So the mRNA goes into the cells and basically it goes through translation and produces the viral proteins. So essentially, this mRNA, we're, in, we're putting in the viral code and the body produces the viral proteins itself and then it will recognize these proteins as foreign. And then um, it will cause a primary response and fight off, uh, and then know the correct antibody to when it encounters the actual virus. And now why that's, um, why that's uh, useful is that uh, mRNA vaccines are faster and cheaper to manufacture. And a new study using mRNA uh, for, uh, we've used it uh, for the hemagglutinin uh, viral protein in all 20 different influenza types. So some common questions and misconceptions. Is influenza a minor illness? Generally, yes, influenza is not too major of an issue. Every, people can fight it off in around a week, but there can be severe complications, so everyone should be aware of that. Now, I want to talk about the difference between cold and like COVID-19 versus influenza. The cold, cold and COVID-19 are, are different families of viruses, rhinoviruses and coronaviruses respectively, while influenza is a different group. And finally, I want to talk about swine flu and bird flu. Now these are also types of influenza, they're for different strains. And they are zoonotic variants, which means they originally attacked pigs and birds, but now they have changed to be able to attack humans. So to address the influenza problem, there have been national vaccination campaigns to help build confidence in the vaccines and to reduce disparities in adult vaccinations. There are vaccination clinics which offer free influenza vaccines to anyone. So everyone has a chance to get it for free and it's just open to everyone. So I think, and because this vaccine is safe, everyone uh, should get it. It's important to practice proper hand hygiene because it prevents transmission of influenza as well as uh, masking and proper cough hygiene when you, are, when you think you are at risk of, of transmission. And finally, um, I, I want to uh, have more community advocacy, which is what this forum is all about, because we can spread awareness so people, uh, people can do more about the problem. So for proper hand hygiene, you can either wash your hands with soap and water or use the alcohol-based hand rub. If your hands are visibly dirty or soiled, you should use hand washing because it removes the organic matter, debris, and some loosely adherent microbes. However, if your hands are not uh, like dirty or soiled, uh, you, you should probably use alcohol-based hand rub because it's better at killing microorganisms. So here's a demonstration of proper hand washing from the CDC.
here's a demonstration of alcohol-based hand movements in the scheme. Now to conclude this presentation, flu can be serious, so people should be aware of that. The flu vaccine is completely safe, so everyone should, uh, does, does not have a reason to not get vaccinated. And finally, practice proper hand hygiene. Here are my resources and credits. Um, thanks for coming to our presentation, uh, and if you have any questions, now it's time to ask. Okay, I have a question. Sure. Um, why the flu always happen in the like uh, October-ish, this kind of season, this oh, time oh, frame? I'll explain this also in the presentation, but um, it happens during, around this time because this is uh, during the fall and winter, it's generally colder. So people tend to stay more indoors and because of that, um, it's easier to spread it from person to person. If you're outside, all the droplets can get dispersed by the wind pretty quickly, so, so, so there's a lower chance if you're outside. And also, um, when it's colder, the mucous membrane mm -hmm. uh, in the nose, right, and, and the mouth, uh, like in the, 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 the actually is this first line of defense mm -hmm. against um, the bacteria, pathogens entering your body. But then, when it's colder, that, that area sort of dries more, so it's easier for the pathogens to get through. Mm -hmm. So you'll have a higher risk of getting sick. Well, that's a good question. Um, it depends on the type of transmission, right? Um, if, let's say, for example, airborne transmission is a lot more dangerous than droplet transmission because it stays in the air, it hangs in the air, which means that, let's say, you cough in a room, it'll just stay there for quite a while. And that's why indoors environments are pretty dangerous. And masking is definitely recommended for airborne transmission. I think COVID-19 is airborne transmission, so the precautions are slightly different. And um, COVID-19, well, um, I guess um, in the end we handled it uh, with a vac vaccine, so we, we used mRNA vaccination for it, which I think is pretty awesome. Okay. Next, we'll have our presentation next on November 4th, we'll be talking, talking about diabetes and um, opioids. Our next presenter will be Ashka talking about feminist, uh, feminine medicine.